I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we do. Those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth because it's beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like you know grassroots neighborhood organizations a lot of these were sponsored by the church what does it mean to say that the christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there um you're always uh being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects welcome to the magnificast a podcast about christianity and leftist politics i'm your co-host matt bernico and i'm your other co-host dean detloff dean i have this breaking news that i learned at church I come from dust, and I'm going to become dust again someday. What do you think about that? Mm, that sounds like a real bummer. <laughs> yeah, did you go to get some of those great ashes on your head? You know, it was pretty snowy here in Toronto, and I was, like, putting it off. I was going to go in the morning to morning mass, and by the time I could go late in the day, it was uh, not um, not capable. I was not capable of leaving my apartment, so no, I didn't go this oh, year. bummer. So I went to a real Catholic church to get ashes Whoa. imposed upon my head i know why i missed the episcopal mass the the morning of ash wednesday and uh, i had to go to the catholic church down the street so you gotta watch it yeah <laughs> that's how they get you <laughs> they get you in the door for ash wednesday to tell you that you're going to become dust again someday and then next thing you know you're a papist <laughs> listen bad news <laughs> you want to want to figure out what to do about it keep coming come next week well, so anyways, I was there. It was great. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, do you have any big Lenten plans? I do have uh, exactly one big Lenten plan, and coincidentally, it's the topic of this week's episode. Do you want wow. to hear about it now, or do you want to hear about it later? I'm really glad that I asked you that question, since it's about this podcast. I'd love to hear about <laughs> it right now. Great. Um, my big Lenten plan is I am going to write letters every week of Lent to a variety of folks trying to urge them to lift the blockade on Cuba, the U.S.-sponsored blockade. Um, I'm specifically going to write to everybody's favorite second Catholic president of the United States, Joe Biden, and also my representatives in Michigan, who are still forced to deal with me because I do fill out my U.S. taxes despite living in Canada. <laughs> and uh, I'm also going to write to my uh, Canadian MP to uh, suggest that they should find a, a voice on Cuba as well. And we, this time, this week, are going to urge our listeners to do the same. You might have seen that we put out uh, a resource about this already on our Twitter, um, and uh, you can check that out. We'll remind you about it again at the end. You also might remember that we did a bunch of episodes during Advent and Christmas about Cuba, and I think in January I said we were going to take a break, but guess what? We're not doing that. Um, and I think it's liturgically uh grounded to do it this way matt that's what i'm gonna say to anybody who's upset about it because advent and lent are sort of homonyms in the liturgical calendar they're both seasons of expectation um we you know we used the one leading up to jesus's birthday for cuba and now we're at least using this first lenten episode to talk about cuba again so really you could just see this as an extension of kind of living with cuba through the liturgical year and uh, i encourage people to to find that, this episode. Wow, that sounds like a lot of cool things that you're doing for Lent. It's such a weird happenstance, but I'm also doing those things for Lent. In fact, I've already written one big letter to Joe Biden, the, the Catholic president, the second one, you're, you're right. <laughs> um, and it was a great spiritual practice for me. Um, luckily, we had written a, a really great sample letter, so I knew exactly what to say already. Um, but the downside to it all is that I don't know the last time I've actually written something by hand and my hand cramped up so bad. <laughs> so um, not only can you uh, engage in the spiritual practice of like uh, giving up injustice for Lent, uh, but you can also strengthen your hand muscles, which is, I think, pretty important to have. I think so. You have to have those, those good, strong hands. Okay. 
you do gotta have those good strong hands and i can't wait to hear what he writes back with his good strong hands to use specifically. <laughs> now i'm not expecting a reply but you never know um we'll talk about the the letter writing thing i think specifically towards the end of the episode but yeah like dean said you should definitely go to our twitter our uh, instagram and uh take a gander at what we got there we got some resources that just says uh you know why we're doing this um what why it might matter um, what we can ask of our elected officials, even if we don't like them very much, about uh, what they can do with Cuba. And um, there's a sample letter that you can kind of use yourself to, um, you know, to, to write something should you feel led to. And I'm saying you should feel led to. By the end of this hour, you are going to feel led to. We're going to lead you to do it. Um, <laughs> it's a, I think it's always easiest, actually, to write a letter to a representative when you feel confident about what you're saying and what you think. Um, I mean, whatever, I'll click the button that sends the email to my representatives a million times without having to think twice about it for this or that campaign. But if I'm going to take the time to sit down and really write something with my cramping hand, I do feel like it's important to have uh, a little bit of a background. So I think that is what we're going to try to do here. Right, Matt? <laughs> am, I, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna, we're exactly. Gonna, yeah, we're going to try to uh, provide a little more context, background on the blockade, um, exactly what some of the moving parts are around it, like who has the power to do what, what do we actually need to ask people to do, and at the very end, we'll also tack on, in an important way, I think, some info about how Christians have already found their voice around uh, lifting the blockade, including some Christians you might not expect. So we're hoping to sort of develop a bit of a, a Christian voice this Lent around the blockade. Yeah, that's right. So here's a quick overview of this episode, just to know, you know what you're getting beforehand. So we're going to talk really quickly um, about the history of the blockade, like when did it start, what does it do, um, some of the legislation, like the the nuts and bolts of the blockade. Um, and uh, it's important to note here at the top that the blockade can only be ended by Congress. That's an important thing. So if you want to write a letter to somebody, um, make your congressperson one of them. Um, the other part of the, uh, the episode that we're going to talk about here is the um, – a designation called state sponsors of terror, which uh, there are only four countries listed on it currently. And you can probably guess which ones they are, but Cuba is one of them for sure. And uh, that one, Joe Biden himself does have the power to end. So we're going to talk about that um, and how it got there. Um, so yeah, it'll be a good episode. So Dean, do you want to talk us through the history of the blockade and we'll, we'll start there. I'd love to do exactly that. Um, all right. Cuba, they had a great revolution in 1959 and uh, Fidel Castro and the gang, they pulled it off, they defeated the dictator, and they wanted to build a new society. One wild thing about Cuba is in the initial stages, as we've talked about before on this podcast, it was not a communist uh, project. There were communists involved in the fight against Batista, but it wasn't a unified communist sort of you know, front, and even the early government was not a communist government. That took a long time to develop. Nevertheless, two years after the uh, revolution, the U.S. imposed an embargo blocking all exports to Cuba, uh, except for food and medicine, they say. But as we'll learn, um, that's not the case. Food and medicine also are prevented um, from entering into Cuba and lots of other problems involved. Um, one thing that people often talk about when they refer to the blockade is a letter from a guy named Lester D. Malaroy, a real State Department kind of name. Um, Lester D. Malloray wrote this this uh, memorandum in 1960. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. And he wrote about the purposes on this memorandum uh, of the sanctions, saying this. The majority of Cubans support Castro. There is no effective political opposition. The only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba, a line of action which makes the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wages to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of the government. And this memorandum is usually pointed to by the Cuban government and lots of other people to say, look, Here's the real purpose of the sanctions. Um, as we'll learn, the ostensible purpose of the sanctions or the blockade, um, the U.S. prefers to call it an embargo, by the way. Uh, other people say blockade. Uh, 
Um, so we'll probably use them interchangeably, I guess. But uh, the re- the ostensible purpose, the reason the U.S. says that they have it, uh, changes all the time. But everybody sort of points to this memorandum as kind of the, the true purpose. And I think it's a pretty good case to be made. It's straight from the horse's mouth here in one sense. But it's also maybe the one unifying thread that unifies all the uh, the other bad reasons for the blockade is that the U.S. does want to uh, cause suffering in hopes that people will uh, overthrow the government. Um, maybe just a few more pieces and we can talk a little bit more about the blockade in general. Um, in uh, 1962, Cuba nationalized U.S.-owned oil refineries, and that uh, created more pretext for a blockade. They nationalized a bunch of other stuff, too, but um, the United States was clearly trying to punish what they saw as a like burgeoning socialist project. Um, and since then, there's been a pretty widespread movement to oppose the blockade. It prevents Cuba from doing all kinds of stuff. Um, it has intensified over the many decades um, for example, like it makes it hard for Cuba to buy building materials. It makes it hard for them to get um, pharmaceuticals. It makes it hard for them to buy uh, all kinds of like chemical fertilizers and things like that. Like they can't industrialize their economy the way they want to, etc. Lots of like it's an explicit attempt to stall development. Um, and the movement against the blockade is not only found by like among Marxists or radicals or leftists. But every year since 1992, almost every single country represented in the United Nations, except for the U.S. and Israel, has voted favorably to pass resolutions to end the blockade. Um, Most recently, also, there was a vote at the U.N. in 2022. And same same story. Uh, Ukraine abstained from the vote and Brazil under, under Bolsonaro also abstained, but every other country voted yes. And one last note here, and then we can maybe talk about a couple other pieces. In 2018, here's maybe something on the economic side of the blockade. Uh, In 2018, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimated that since their inception, U.S. sanctions have cost the Cuban economy $130 billion. That number has gone up since 2019 because of COVID and travel restrictions and tourism is like a huge part of Cuba's economy. So that's been huge. And in 2022, Cuba's Minister of Foreign Affairs told the United Nations that since 2019, the United States government has escalated the embargo. Its cumulative economic damage has amounted to 152, or excuse me, 154.22 billion dollars at current prices. And I mean, that's a huge amount of money for any country to lose, but especially a very, very small island like Cuba. Uh, you have to imagine if a country like that had one hundred and fifty four billion dollars, how different that country would be today. Yeah. So that's some of the the history and maybe the more recent like cumulative economic effects. Yeah, it's a great note. I mean, just to, I mean, I know that we're talking about economics, we're talking about history, we're talking about politics here. But just to like really quickly bring in the Christian angle of our podcast um, there's no way to square this with the gospel, right? Like if you're a Christian person, there's just like no way to make sense of this. Even if you're not a leftist Christian person, there's no way to make sense of this. You can't read the gospel, um, and be like, wow, Jesus tells you to care about all these poor people. Uh, you know, all this kind of stuff, uh, the least of these, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) The Sermon of the Mount, it's all in there, right? (laughs) Um, And then also be like, yeah, but it is okay to definitely deprive a small country um, of a whole lot of money and definitely starve out a lot of people who are there just like existing. Uh, Just just an important moral condemnation, I think. (laughs) It's it's damning, to say the least, very literally. Yeah. Uh, Two other pieces related to that, I think, that are important. Um, The first is that The U.S. says that the sanctions are designed to target the government and people in government and not the Cuban people. And that is obviously not true. Um, It's the Cuban people who feel the effects of the sanctions most. And whatever you feel about the Cuban government, the fact of the matter is they are the government that buys and sells stuff. (laughs) And like like any government creates terms of trade and trade deals and so on. Um, And the idea that there is this kind of clean separation between the people of Cuba and the government of Cuba, and also the idea that those two things could never be unified or, you know, that the government could represent the people. Those are assumptions that don't bear themselves out. So that is important to say. And the other is that uh, the blockade is really awful. Um, You know, like uh, I've talked about before, when I was there in December, you could really see the effects of the blockade. It's very bad. 
Um, nevertheless, even despite that, uh, Cuba has managed to build a pretty impressive society, even with that stacked against them. And I think that's really important. Like, you know, people don't like starve to death in Cuba, um, despite not having access to all kinds of uh, food trade deals. They don't, um, you know, they don't lack health care in Cuba, all these kinds of things. And I think that is really important as well. And also kind of a double damnation on the U.S. that like, the United States will prevent Cuba uh, from getting all kinds of stuff by virtue of the blockade. But even as the richest country in the world, it can't guarantee its citizens what it is trying to deny the people of Cuba. So I think it's just, you know, <laughs> it's like uh, a testament to Cuba, too, that even despite that uh, incredibly awful kind of David and Goliath battle, um, they still haven't given up those, uh, you know, social services or investments. Yeah, that's right. That reminds me of um, there's a there's a documentary called Cuba and the Cameraman, um, and on it this uh, well, ba- basically the setup of the documentary is that there's this guy who's following around Fidel Castro and kind of just taking this documentary footage of him and also kind of doing this documentary thing about Cuba in general. But there's this um, section where uh, Fidel is on this plane, and somebody asks Fidel like, "Oh, you know, you're not gonna wear like a bulletproof vest under your shirt?" And he's like, "No, I have like a I have a moral a moral vest that protects me." <laughs> And I don't know, it seems it seems like it rings true, though, right? Even despite all of these odds, uh, Cuba is still uh, doing, trying to do the right thing um, by the people. And um, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, exactly. Um, to add a little bit more here, and then we'll talk about the, the nuts and bolts of it, um, the legislative pieces. Uh, there's also a really interesting angle where the Cuban government will often talk about the blockade as a a genocide, which I think is some interesting rhetoric. Um, There's a nice summary in a book called The Economic War Against Cuba by Salim Lamrani. It's from Monthly Review. It's from 2013, so it's dated. Like It doesn't take into account Trump or Biden as presidents, but it's a really good primer if you're looking for that. Um, In it, he says this, The Cuban authorities condemn economic sanctions in the strongest terms. According to Havana, it's a genocidal policy to justify its position. Cuba bases its argument on two elements, the Geneva Convention and a U.S. memorandum, uh, the one that I read earlier um, about uh, creating these bad conditions in Cuba. The Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of December 9, 1948, states in Article 2 that, quote, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Points that follow allude to causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And so that's the, you know, the means by which the Cuban government Uh, says that it is genocidal and it's pretty compelling (laughs) i mean it is uh exactly what the u.s has the stated purpose of of trying to do right to inflict harm on the people of cuba so intensely that they themselves would you know get sick of it and rise up against their government so i just wanted to kind of get that out there too that the blockade is is bad but it's like potentially genocidally bad and one thing that's really remarkable about cuba is that in its opposition to the blockade, it often appeals to international law to say that like, or and like internationally agreed upon definitions and so on to say, look, the whole world would talk about it like this, but somehow the U.S. reserves the right to ignore that or contradict it. And I think that is also a really important piece. Yeah, for sure. It is an important piece. Um, I think compelling case made by Cuba. <laughs> um and in a in a great example too of the ways that the United States sort of like has the hegemonic power to sort of set the um the terms of discussion, which is bad. Um and a good reason to maybe talk through some of the stuff to figure out exactly what's going on there. Well, let's turn and talk about some of the legal nuts and bolts. I mean, like that's that's some good history and some good um information about how people talk about the uh blockade in Cuba, but let's talk about like 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 what's actually happening in terms of, um, you know, legislation. It's it's good to know the story of the blockade, right? But it is also great to have something else to hang on to in terms of like what act, like what legislation is actively doing this, and then um, based on that, you can kind of figure out um, what levers of power you'd have to pull to maybe get them to be undone. 
Mm -hmm. So the U.S. sanctions regime against Cuba has some statutory components that can only be changed by Congress, right? So this is the congressional piece. Um, Two of the most damaging laws uh, were adapted in the 90s, the Torricelli Act of 1992 and the Helms-Burton Act of 1996. So these are the two pieces that we're going to talk about specifically, um, and we're going to bring a few resources together to kind of explain what is going on with all of these. So from that same Lamrani piece uh, before, this is the description of the Torricelli Act. For 30 years, U.S. diplomatic rhetoric justified the economic state of siege against Cuba by pointing a finger at the Havana-Moscow alliance. In 1992, following the disintegration of the Soviet Union, rather than normalizing relations with the Castro government, the administration of George H.W. Bush signed the Torricelli Act, which tightened the sanctions against Cuba and made it no longer possible to explain the conflict between two nations in terms of the Cold War. Washington then brandished another argument designed to justify the intensifications of sanctions, the violations of human rights in Cuba. Okay, so the Torricelli Act is important because it moves it moves past like the Cold War um, positioning of the United States, right? And it kind of codifies a lot of those uh, stances into specific legislation, um, and that is important. So this is uh, this next quote is from. Joy Gordon in a piece that they wrote for Commonweal called The Sanction Crisis. And that's where a lot of this information is going to come from uh, coming up here. So just hold on to your butt. So Joy Gordon writes, the Torricelli Act prohibited foreign subsidiaries of the U.S. companies from trading with Cuba. As a result of the Torricelli Act, companies all over the world were subject to severe penalties by the U.S. Treasury Department if they bought or sold goods or services from Cuba. The effect on Cuba was enormous. It was barred from trade, not only with U.S. companies, but also with countless other companies throughout the world. So there you go. That's like the first piece. Um, Companies can't trade with Cuba. And if they do, there are, you know, repercussions from the United States. Um, A a pretty big blow. I mean, that's an embargo, right? (laughs) What do you think, Dean? (laughs) I think it's bad. Um, It's interesting for uh, a lot of different reasons. I think the, the context that you mentioned um, the historical piece is really significant that this is the end of the Cold War ostensibly was like a chance for the U.S. to normalize relations, to have real diplomacy. And as we see with Cuba, but also lots of other countries um, like Korea and so on that had these longstanding Cold War conflicts with, it chose the opposite to tighten the screws. And the Torricelli Act, I think, is especially important because it comes right uh, around the the time of what will be called in Cuba the special period in the 90s, which is they, first of all, lost um, trade with uh, the Soviet Union as the, the bloc collapsed, which totally devastated the economy. But the Torricelli Act basically guaranteed that Cuba couldn't find, like, as easily at least, it couldn't rebound by finding new trading partners or kind of rebuilding, you know, as the geopolitical situation was changing. And I think this is exactly the the example that you have of kind of delivering on that memorandum we read earlier, right? Trying to create conditions so uh, inhumane or, or kind of frustrating that people just don't settle for it, that they're not, you know, they're fed up and they want to get rid of the communist government. So I think it's important to also recognize that the U.S. is sort of just flexing its muscle as like the, you know, the ruler of international capital. People would rather trade with the U.S. than trade with Cuba because the U.S. is a giant market and Cuba is a very small market. And that is what sets the terms of geopolitics uh, in the especially in the post Cold War period. But um, even today, despite the rise of other big economies, the U.S. still has this kind of economic veto power essentially through its own legislation and wielding that against Cuba is especially cruel. It is uh, a, min- a moment ago. You said, you know, they were, they were tightening the screws and if the screws couldn't get any tighter, uh, they do. So that's 1992 is the Torricelli act. But then later in 1996, things get even worse with pa- uh, the passage of the Helms Burton act. Um, uh, the Helms Burton act again, does more of that codification work of the embargo on like trade and financial transactions. It also like re- it, it establishes further, like the tone on us policy in, in terms of like only supporting a, a free and independent Cuba. Right. So, um, flexing that muscle again, in terms of, um, you know, who sets the rules for international trade and, um, especially in that region. Right. 
So um, we'll, we'll talk about specifically what the Helm's Burnt Neck does in just one second, but let's get some more of that good historical stuff on the table because this one is particularly spicy, I think. <laughs> um, maybe spicy is the wrong word. It's just like, it's just incredibly stupid. <laughs> So uh, this is again from that Lamrani piece um, that Dean mentioned earlier from the monthly review. So on March 12th, 1996, under the Clinton administration, Congress passed the Helms-Burton Act, widely considered a legal aberration because of its retroactive and extraterritorial reach. This legislation was approved following a serious incident that had occurred on February 24th, 1996, off the Cuban coast, when a plane belonging to the Brothers to the Rescue Organization, um, which is an organization of, like, um, <laughs> disaffected Cubans who lost the revolution <laughs> and, and, and moved to Miami. Actual terrorists. Yeah, that's right. So... Um, this plane belonging to the Brothers to Rescue organization was shot down by the Cuban army after repeatedly violating Cuban airspace to drop leaflets urging the population into uh, insurrection. So, I mean, like, this is, I guess this is why it feels so stupid to me, because it's like um, this organization that is definitely funded by the United States um, does a weird covert op and drops leaflets in Cuba, and then Cuba shoots down the plane, and then the United States is like, whoa, you can't do that. <laughs> so we're, we're going to tighten sanctions even more. I mean, it's just so, it's so egregious because like, I mean, Cuba is a country, whether the United States likes it or not. And like, if anyone has the right to protect their own airspace, I guess it's a sovereign country, <laughs> but uh, the United States definitely does not see it that way. Yeah. I mean, the idea too of like, can you imagine if a Cuban pilot was like flying around Florida, dropping leaflets, encouraging people to like have an insurrection against the U.S. government? Like, yeah, probably that wouldn't go very well, is my guess. So <laughs> it's a pretty bad double standard here that ends up being a pretext for an incredibly weird legal maneuver. That's true. But but Joe Biden did take a really long time to shoot down some of those spy balloons. So <laughs> maybe it would go OK. <laughs> true. That's true. Man, if there was a spy balloon that did come from Cuba and that did drop leaflets, that'd be kind of fun. I'd be into that. I'd like to get um, one. I would love. I would love a leaflet, a commemorative leaflet for that occasion. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, like I said, the Helms Burton Act it like codifies a lot of a lot more of that uh, that embargo policy about trade and like financial stuff. Um, but maybe there's there, there's this more egregious part that I think is really worth talking about. This is from that Joy Gordon article that we mentioned a minute ago from the um, from Commonweal. So Joy Gordon writes, one of its most significant components allowed Cubans who had left the island after the revolution and become U.S. citizens to sue any foreign company whose business in Cuba involved property that had been confiscated from them. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> so, for example, the Bacardi building, a beautiful Art Deco building in Old Havana, is now owned by the Cuban government. An Italian or Spanish company that wants to open a store or have an office in the building is at risk of being sued in the United States by the Bacardi Company. So like the Torricelli Law, this is uh, still the Joy Gordon quote, like the Torricelli Law, this also provokes the ire of the international community. In effect, U.S. courts could subject a foreign company, such as a Spanish hotel chain, to being sued in the United States for having actions involving a property in a foreign country, taken from a foreign citizen, and now used by a foreign entity. Under international law, these measures are considered to be extraterritorial, that is, the United States is illegitimately subjecting foreign parties to its own jurisdiction. So this is such a wild, uh, a wild part of the law because um, it says, you know, that that if a company is is doing business with with assets that have been seized by the state of Cuba, you know, they can be sued, which is such a wild thing. Obviously, it would like dissuade a lot of um, companies, a lot of outside, um, you know, corporations from outside of Cuba and outside of the U.S from doing business in Cuba because it puts them into all kinds of like legally scrutinous situations they don't want to be in for sure. So uh, all that to say it's all very bad and like, you know, pretty sketchy though, in terms of legality, I think is the interesting part that um, in, under international law, like oh, this is, this is all maybe not, maybe this is all like probably illegal. And um, in fact, Joy Gordon goes on to say that every year since 1992, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted a resolution denouncing the U.S. embargo as a violation of international law. And nearly every member of the United Nations joins in supporting these, these resolutions. Um, this June, 184 countries supported Cuba's claim and held that the United States was acting illegally. I guess what's important here is that, like, the United States, uh, the Helms-Burton Act is doing something that is you know, illegal. I mean, everyone in the world, nearly everyone in the world, nearly every, sorry, maybe not everyone in the world, nearly everyone that's a part of the United Nations 
agrees that it's illegal, but yet the United States is still doing it because of the, you know, the, the rules based international order that the United States can um, organize and enforce. So um, these two pieces of legislation are definitely like, um, this is not talking about them exhaustively for sure, but these two pieces, the Torricelli law and also the Helms Burton act are the two pieces of legislation you really need to know when it comes to the like congressional enforcement of um, the Cuban blockade so if you're, you know, if you're, if you, right now you're listening to us talk and you're writing this big letter to your congressperson, you can tell them specifically these two are the bad ones. I mean, there's probably other laws as well, but these are, these are the big ones. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's good to know about it too. I mean, I find it boring sometimes to learn all this uh, legal mumbo jumbo, but it's important in particular because when you're asking a congressperson to act, you want to be able to point to specific stuff. If you just say, oh, I don't like the blockade on Cuba, they'll be like, that's fine. There is no blockade on Cuba. So it helps to be like, well, <laughs> I mean this, though, <laughs> specifically. This is what I'm talking about. Um, a couple of other things, maybe to put a fine point on it. I think it's good to draw out some of the effects of the blockade um, and also good things to tell your representatives about. There is a ton of articles you can find. If you just Google like effects of the U.S. embargo against Cuba, you'll find all kinds of stuff. But there's a nice roundup in a fairly recent article in The Guardian by David Adler um, from like a year ago. It's called Cuba has been under U.S. embargo for 60 years. It's time for that to end. And he has a nice kind of list here of things that I'll just read out. Between April 2019 and March 2020 alone, U.S. Office of Foreign Assets control penalties amounted to over $2.4 billion targeting banks, insurance firms, energy companies, and travel agencies alike who were all basically doing business in Cuba. So this is sort of a um, maybe a, a, a consequence of the, the pieces Matt was just talking about, that the U.S. Um, fines and has penalties on these kinds of industries, so it doesn't only allow for legal action. It lets the U.S. basically... Uh, put financial penalties on all kinds of uh, folks or, or all kinds of entities. That's really huge because it means that banks, for example, are really reticent to transfer money to Cuba. Uh, technically, legally, they should be allowed to, but they fear being slapped with a fine or penalty. And uh, that is absurd and creates all kinds of really big problems. Um, Adler goes on to say the UN Food and Agriculture Organization reports that the embargo has had a direct impact on its operations in Cuba, citing costs, losses and damages that have resulted in drastic reduction of agricultural output on the island, despite the fact that the FAO is, quote, officially exempted from the embargo. So the FAO is saying we're supposed to be able to do all this stuff, but we can't. And fun fact about the FAO, uh, Fry Beto the Catholic priest that we talk about all the time from Brazil, who was part of the book uh, Fry, uh, Fidel and Religion. Um, he is the uh, an FAO representative to Cuba, a consultant basically on food sovereignty. So pretty neat liberation theology connection. Uh, two more things. The UN Development Program cites its own challenges in the implementation of projects like its Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria in Cuba, in particular, when Toyota Gibraltar stock holdings was forced to cancel the supply of vehicles to the UNDP office as a result of tightened U.S. restrictions in 2018. And lastly, the UN Environmental Program highlights the ways in which the U.S. embargo not only affects that Caribbean country, but also the subregion and the United States itself. According to the UNEP, the embargo eliminates the possibility of regional cooperation on environmental issues, and prevents the diffusion of critical technology to drive a green transition on the island. So again, like the international community, the United Nations, the thing that the U.S. is supposed to be part of uh, is constantly telling the U.S. like, hey, we can't do all the stuff that we are supposed to be able to do. And that's because of you. And the United States doesn't care. But those uh, effects, I think, are really significant, even on a global scale. Um, and of course, even beyond that, the blockade just reaches into the everyday lives of people all over the island, right? Like people don't have access to food and medicine that they need. Um, they don't have access to uh, all kinds of like basic consumer goods. Um, it's difficult to get things like electronics there. Uh, inflation is out of control. It's like if you think eggs are expensive in the U.S., wait till you get to Cuba. Um, it's really tough. So uh, just to cite some of the the fallout of these legal decisions. Yeah, that's good. Um, a good thing to know about a bad thing 
to have happen. <laughs> <laughs> so not only all of that, but also another piece of the of the story is the um the ban on like remittances. So um remittances are like, you know, people who are um from Cuba but they live in the United States and they might want to send money back to their family or something, right? So that that money is also embargoed basically. Um, this is from that same David Adler piece. According to Oxfam, remittances are the main source of direct income for about half of the population of Cuba. But in the fall of 2019, the Trump administration took measures to drastic, drastically reduce the financial remittances sent to Cubans by friends and family members abroad. Family remittances were limited to $1,000 each quarter, and then remittances to friends and organizations were prohibited altogether, as were remittances to distant relatives. And there were other restrictions, too. People outside the United States had been permitted to send dollar-denominated transactions from, say, like a Spanish bank, which would go through the U.S. financial system and then to another foreign bank. Uh, those are prohibited in 2019, making it harder for foreign nationals living in foreign countries to send funds to their families in Cuba. So um, all, of, all of the blockade stuff is happening, but then even people who are Cuban um, living, you know, um, in... <laughs> Even people who are Cuban living abroad can't even send money back to their families, or they can, but very little, far yeah. less than they should. One note, too, about the remittances piece. Um, sometimes people will also single out Cuba to be like, oh, well, the fact that they're so reliant on remittances just shows that the system is bad or not working. Um, first of all, if the blockade was lifted, the economy would be better and they probably wouldn't need to rely so heavily on remittances. So that's important. But secondly, remittances are actually a huge source of income for countries all over the global south. Like yeah. remittances are sent back to lots of other places in the Caribbean in a big way, like Haiti and elsewhere. Um, India receives tons of remittances. Right. So just to sort of point out, like it's not part of the story of like, oh, Cuba is just uniquely poor, but um, they are uniquely targeted for not being able to uh, have that source of income that so many other countries in the global south rely on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know. I've organized with workers who send remittances to their family in Central America or in Mexico, yeah. right? It's not like a. It, it it also happens in countries that are perfectly capitalist, right? It's not. Right. It's not the. <laughs> that's not the, the root cause. Um, okay, so all of that stuff we've just been talking about. That's that's the blockade. That's the stuff that Congress has to fix and that we have to make them fix by writing letters, you know. And they might not respond ever, and you know whatever, uh, but. Writing letters seems like a pretty small ask, I think, <laughs> in in regards to the whole thing. So that's a congressional problem. But there's also the other presidential side of things, right? There's a there's a, a part of the problem that Joe Biden himself could pick up his pen right now, um, even if he's in bed. He could pick up a pen and still sign off on this whole thing and 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 this other piece of the the blockade. So there is a term that you need to know about called state sponsors of terrorism which is a designation that's given to countries that, according to the U.S. State Department, have provided support for acts of international terrorism. There are only four countries on this list, and like I said earlier, you can definitely guess which ones. It's Cuba, Iran, the DPRK, and Syria. Those are the four. There have been a few other entries to that list over the years, but those are the four current ones and the ones that you need to worry about. So the result of being on this list imposes a number of additional sanctions on those countries, and they make life even harder for the people who live there. Um, if, if like the existing sanctions weren't enough, this is even just like ratcheting it up even more. Um, I think earlier in the episode, Dean, you said that like the, uh, you said that the sanctions keep kind of like escalating and this is a great example of how it's, it's nuts. So from the state department website, um, it lists out a few different explanations of like what sanctions a, con a country might suffer on if they're on the state sponsor of terrorism list. And, uh, the U uh, S state department says this. The four main categories of sanctions resulting from designations under these authorities include restrictions on U.S. foreign assistance, a ban on defense exports and sales, certain controls over exports of dual-use items, and miscellaneous financial and other restrictions. So, I, I mean, there you go, right? More and more restrictions on assistance and on financial restrictions, more things just to make life more unlivable in Cuba for people who live there. It's bad. Mm -hmm. So you might be asking yourself, how did Cuba get on this list? How do you get them off this list? And what does that all look like? 
So Cuba was first added to this list in 1982 because of its history supporting revolutionary movements throughout the world. So I think saying that's a state sponsor of terrorism is, I think, already pretty dubious, but uh, it gets even worse than that, right? Maybe there's a case to be made in 1982 if you're a capitalist country, but I think it's still sketchy. It's sketchy then and it gets worse now. <laughs> I think the question is just like, is Cuba actually doing that? Like, is Cuba actually, um, you know, supporting terrorist efforts throughout the world? And um, I try to look up a bunch of different uh, people from the government uh, across administrations from different presidents. And the consensus is no. <laughs> Basically, nobody thinks that, which is kind of funny in a perverse way. Um, so I'm going to bring in a few quotes here that lay out the um, the opinion from different parts of uh, presidential administrations on, on Cuba. So the first is from this guy, Larry Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff of the then Secretary of State Colin Powell during the George W. Bush uh, administration. So Larry Wilkerson says, Cuba is not a state sponsor of terrorism. That was a mantra from the moment I walked into the State Department to the moment I walked out, he said. It's a fiction that we have created to reinforce the rationale for the blockade. There you go. Okay, so that's that's from George W. Bush's administration. How about this, though? The Obama administration, they also maintained this uh, particular stance that, that Cuba was not a state sponsor of terrorism. Ben Rhodes, who was one of Obama's deputy national security advisors, he tweeted uh, back in 2015 that, put simply, the president of the United States is acting to remove Cuba from the state sponsor of terrorism list because Cuba is not a state sponsor of terror. So in 2015, Obama... Uh, the Obama administration did remove Cuba from the list. And that was a pretty big deal, right? That's that thaw that we've talked about a few times uh, during the Obama administration. So here's two different administrations, um, one Republican, one Democrat, who both think that uh, the idea that Cuba is a sp state sponsor of terrorism is, is a fiction. It's not true. Yeah. There you go. And at least Obama acted accordingly. And that's something. Yeah, we can talk in a minute about how that has changed since Obama. But I think it's also worth pointing out that the rhetoric is really um, two faced because the idea is that Cuba is sponsoring state or sponsoring terrorism because they support these revolutionary movements, which like they did do right. Like Cuba trained the Sandinistas, for example, Cuba supported Angola, right? Like all these other revolutionary moments and movements. But that in itself is not actually like illegal internationally. No. Um, right. which is very important. And also there's a distinction to be made between that and terrorism. So that's important. Um, also, the reason it's two-faced is at this time, especially in the 80s, the United States was actively funding terrorist efforts against Cuba, like explicitly. And I think that's really important that like the plane that we mentioned down to that kind of prompted the Helms-Burton Act um, the Brothers to the Rescue is a, an organization that is basically a set of Cuban exiles um, who actively did uh, commit acts of terror, including like their president at that time. Um, I forget his name right now, but he uh, admitted to basically killing like 20 people um, in Cuba and like a bazooka thing, like some bizarre adventurist kind of activity. Um if you listen to like a podcast like Blowback, they have a whole season about Cuba and state terrorism against it. You can hear more about it there. Um, man, if you're ever in Havana, you can go to the the uh, Memorial of Denunciation and learn all about it there. But uh, I guess the short of it is like it's pretty bizarre that the U.S. would accuse Cuba of being a state sponsor of terror while it is actively as a state sponsoring terror terror against Cuba. So just to underline how bizarre all this is. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I think it's it's always kind of uh, silly that the United States uh, would uh, would accuse anybody of being a state sponsor of terror because they actively do this, right? Not only against Cuba, but against other Latin American countries in, in the Middle East, all kinds of places that uh, the United States ends up like training or arming people who, you know, perform terrorism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's wild. Back to the matter at hand here. In the George W. Bush administration, people thought that the designation was uh, fake Obama, the Obama administration believed so strongly that it was fake that they removed them from the list uh, in 2015, which is, like I said a minute ago, good, but um, like Dean pointed out, duplicitous. But then we get to the Trump presidency, which I think is actually pretty important because Cuba's removed in 2015, but then they're added back to the list later in 2019. And that story is very interesting, too, 
because though Trump adds Cuba back to the, the list of state sponsors of terrorism, I think it's also pretty easy to see how like Trump is really just pandering when he does that. And it's like not really to be taken very seriously. I mean, it's, it's you should take it seriously because they're added back to the list, but you shouldn't think that because they were that Trump has some kind of like evidence that backs this up in some kind of serious way. So um, here's a, a piece that I think we can talk through from The Nation that was actually published uh, just today by Guillaume Long, who uh, who wrote a piece called Biden should reverse Trump's designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, it's worth reading. We'll link it in the show notes and you can take a look at it and, and see what we're talking about here. But this is um, a, a pretty long quote from the, p- the piece that kind of explains what Trump was doing when he added um, Cuba back to the list and like why it's very suspicious. So um, this is from this, the, the long piece in, in the nation. If Trump's motives were dishonest, the process by which Cuba was put back on the list was even more deceitful. Trump found an opening not in Cuban support for war or terror, but in Cuba's support for peace, specifically Colombia's peace. Cuba had been the host of the talks that led to the September 2016 peace deal between the Colombian government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. So that's the FARC guerrillas, um, if you'll recall. So at the same time, there were negotiations between another group, the National Liberation Army, the ELN, and the Colombian government uh, that were happening in Ecuador. So Cuba was acting as like a negotiator in the peace process for Colombia between these like different um, guerrilla factions, basically, right? So Cuba was acting not as a support for guerrilla war, for terrorism, none of that, right? Cuba was working to broker a deal between these two groups to end like a decades long guerrilla war that would bring peace to Colombia. That's what was happening. Uh, However, there was, I mean, this is kind of cutting the story short, definitely. But there was basically a deadlock in the negotiations when Ivan Duque was elected president of Colombia. Duque is, uh, you might remember when we've talked to like Hector in the past, uh, an extremely right wing guy and ran on opposing the peace process, which is quite the thing to oppose. Anyways, the deadlock that started there spiraled and ended up leading to more violence between the guerrilla factions. Because, you know, even though Cuba's trying to broker this peace and um, people on the right were against the peace process, there were also people um, involved in the guerrilla factions who were against the peace process. Um, so anyways, a complicated story. But, as, you know, when, when things get deadlocked, people get very desperate. And, you know, that's just a matter of history, I suppose. So um, anyways, uh, somebody from the ELN, uh, they bombed like a police academy in Colombia. And that starts all this kind of all these problems for uh, Cuba specifically. I mean, in Colombia as well. So the U.S. State Department, who was then led by Mike Pompeo, he capitalized on the situation of this like sort of deadlocked peace negotiations and also the spiraling violence that kind of has come out of the deadlock. And based on all that, he adds Cuba back to the state sponsor of terrorism list when Cuba affirmed their neutrality as a negotiator and uh, refused to work with Duque, this right wing Colombian guy, Colombian president, to extradite guerrillas who were involved in in a bombing. Right. So Cuba was like basically affirming that they're there to be a part of like a negotiation and the peace process, not to be like, you know, a stick to be wielded against these uh, these two groups. So the moral of the story here is that Obama's administration and George W. Bush's administration didn't think that Cuba was actually a state sponsor of terrorism. Trump's administration only made the case that they were in like a really dishonest and like dubious way, to say the very least. In light of all of that, I think, right, it only makes sense that Joe Biden would simply roll back Trump's Cuba policy because it's it's like clearly stupid and based on half truths and um, lots of skewing of the story. And also he said that he would do it on the campaign. That's true. Trail. He did say that. So Joe Biden, come through, please do one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important to note that Joe Biden can do this. Like I said, at the very top of this particular segment, like even if Joe Biden right now is just taking a giant dump on the toilet, he could get a pencil out and like write this down and like get it done. <laughs> like Joe Biden, all I'm trying to say here is that Joe Biden has the executive power to to take Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism list. That's why <laughs> it's important to write him a letter so that he can read it on the toilet when he's taking a dump. And then he can also... Um, act accordingly. Yeah, I have become a one-issue voter, and the one issue is the Cuba blockade, and whoever says that they're going to remove it, I'll vote for them, and uh, listen, Joe, it's going to be really hard to get me to vote for you next time, and uh, you burned me once on on my one important issue, and that's all. So I I really got to see it in this term. That's what I'm going to tell him in my letter. I'm seeing all kinds of polls right now, and people are asking, like, should Joe Biden run again? And right now, no, I don't think so. But but if he if he does this, maybe I'd think about it. I'd consider it. 
Yeah, I'd mail it in for sure. Um, so, all right, just to wrap up or sum up a little bit here, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Christian piece. Um, the blockade that we talked about earlier, that is a congressional issue. This particular piece of Cuba being on the state sponsor of terrorism list, that is an executive issue, and we can write letters accordingly to people related to that. Um, there have also been, over the years, as we said earlier, lots of... Sorry, one sec. <coughs> there have also been, over the years, as we said earlier, lots of attempts to oppose the blockade, and not just from Marxists. And in particular, Christians have said a lot about it, um, both in the, you know, preceding decades, but also very recently. So I thought I'd do like a lightning round of a few <laughs> of them. Um, so here's some great things that you can mention in your very Christian letter to your elected official. Uh, first of all, the World Council of Churches regularly supports the United Nations call to end the embargo, including most recently in 2022 when the UN had that big vote and everybody said yes, except for the US and Israel and kind of Ukraine and Brazil. Um, that body, the World Council of Churches, first of all, side note, is extremely interesting. If you ever want to learn a lot about lefty Christianity, you should read a history of that organization. But in any case, they represent over 580 million Christians around the whole world, which is a lot of people. Um, it's made up of 352 churches in 120 countries. So basically a handful of different denominations all around the world. They uh, come together to form the WCC. And as I said, the WCC is constantly uh, saying that they should end the blockade. And in fact, they wrote this letter and sent it to the president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, who was tweeting about it after the vote happened uh, in gratitude for the support of the World Council of Churches. So there you have it. The Protestants, you're out there. You got a big voice and you're exercising it. That's great. Um, on the Catholic side, even our most notorious anti-communist popes uh, also think that it should be ended. Um, pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis have all called for an end to the embargo. Uh, specifically, each time a pope goes to Cuba, they basically are like, yeah, this has got to go. And maybe even more surprisingly, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops also says that the embargo should end. And in their statement on it, they point to their agreement with the Cuban bishops that the embargo has to go. And I think that's really important as well, because not all Cuban bishops are like, how to put it, friendly with the Cuban state, I guess, is maybe one way of putting it. Um, but still, they think the embargo has got to go. Uh, and like I said, these popes who are not always friendly toward communist governments, to say the least, um, they've all called on the U.S. to end it. So that's very important. And then lastly, and maybe more specifically to the U.S. and Canada, a lot of denominations regularly call for an end to the embargo. Um, for example, in 2021, there was a letter written by written and signed by a ton of Christians like um, I found it on the website of the Presbyterians in the U.S., but there's tons of signatories. There's Baptists, there's Quakers, there's Episcopals, there's some Catholic religious orders. It's a great, um, a great stew of Christians signing this letter. Um, and the Presbyterians even have a, a whole Cuba policy that you can read about because they have always maintained a denominational link with Presbyterians in Cuba. I think that's true of the Episcopal Church as well. The Episcopal Church was like, uh, it was like an, uh, an independent sort of body for a bit, but they've rejoined the Episcopal Church now. So that's true. Interesting. Great. Uh, so all that to say, like, there is this kind of recognition that Christian solidarity between the two countries mediated through denominations um, does transcend U.S. foreign policy. And I think that's really important because a lot of people who belong to churches that have a more like developed um, institutional framework, like probably you don't know that your church has said something about Cuba and that is important. And if your church hasn't said something about Cuba, you can encourage them to do so. Um, it's also true in Canada that the United Church of Canada, the Presbyterians here, Lutherans, some others um, have also called for Canada to oppose the sanctions more loudly. I mean, they do the vote at the UN, but um, they, well, the Trudeau government in particular has 
Um, not been extremely willing to challenge the U.S. Um, at any point on its foreign policy. So uh, that's important for people in Canada to sort of encourage our own MPs to find a, an independent voice for peace, um, which Canada has done. In fact, um, Canada did not go along with the U.S. on the blockade, very famously, thanks in part to Justin Trudeau's weird dad, Pierre Trudeau. Oh, I thought you were going to say Fidel Castro. Yeah, yeah, his other real dad, Fidel Castro. <laughs> Um, his two dads did not like the embargo at the end of the day. I would watch that show. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What a great sitcom. So all that to say, Christians actually have found a voice on this, but it is not very loud. And I think it's like one thing for a paid staff person who works for a denomination to write a letter and then get a bunch of other paid staff people to like get their denominations to sign the letter. But it's something else altogether to have like people in pews say like, hey, my church has said this and I super agree with it. And I'm telling you, my representative, that it's important to me. Yeah. Right. Like those kinds of things make a huge difference. So I would say try to figure out what your church has already said and build on it or like, you know, encourage your church to say something and say something yourself in the meantime. But all that to say, there's tons of stuff to, to build on as we find a sort of prophetic voice for Cuba uh, in both the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, for sure. So I think that bring, brings us to, I, I mean, the main the main gist of things here, right? We want you to get a piece of paper and write your representatives and write Joe Biden for Lent. That's what we're doing. I already sent my first letter and it was great. Um, and I think it's a great Lenten practice. I, I struggle every single year to think of something to do for Lent that seems like the right degree of seriousness and like uh, also that is, you know, possible <laughs> that I can actually do um, in a given year. <laughs> and I don't know, I, growing up, I was evangelical and no one did Lent. Um, and I would always just see like my Catholic friends, like giving up things like soda or like, you know, fasting from something else, who knows what. But I think that something that's really grasped me in the last few years, I mean, we definitely talked about it last year during our big Lenten series that we did uh is isaiah 58 and isaiah 58 says uh this is not this the fast that i chose to loose the bonds of injustice to undo the thongs of the yoke to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke and i think that that particular type of fasting is something that makes my like it works in my brain in a way that like giving up soda doesn't um <laughs> and uh I, I like it a lot um you know even how about this like I think that like taking up this type of like Lenten practice of, of writing a letter on to, to our government and asking them to like stop doing something that, that is absolutely unjust. It makes sense in, it makes sense in the, uh, Oh my God. It works for Lent because uh, it's a time where, you know, it's not just external, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It, it is it is an external thing that you're actively doing, but it's also like an inward practice that changes you when you write the letters. Um, I mean, my my letter wasn't the best. I gotta say, I'm I'm gonna do some better ones. I think later, but it is a moment where like you have to reflect on your particular position in the world and um, and your spot in it in in terms of like like the evil that your country does, <laughs> and uh, you have to ask them to stop. And I think that there's something um, pretty formative in that particular thing. Um, when I was at the Lenten, when I was when I was at the Ash Wednesday service uh, at the Catholic Church, the Catholic priest said that really all you have to do for Lent is find a way to like lift your face to God, right? That's what you're supposed to be doing, um, and you shouldn't have to like worry about necessarily what exactly you're giving up as long as you're sort of doing that act. How are you? How are you lifting yourself uh, up to think about God? And I think that writing a letter can be one of those types of practices, right, where you're actively recognizing the people that um, that God is on the side of. Um, so you could just do it. You could just write a letter and, um, you know, do as much or as little as you want with it, but you should probably try to do it. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I agree. Uh, two other practical pieces to note. Um, Lent is six weeks long, so you can write up to six letters, um, I guess. <laughs> you can write more. You can write more. Yeah, you can write way more. But uh, I think that is also helpful to me because it's like being able to do something once a week is uh, useful to organize my life, but also doing it several times is very helpful. So anyway, there's six weeks. You can find six targets for your letter. For example, the president, maybe your 
um, your representative in the House, your uh, state senator, for example, and you might find three others, for instance, like maybe a person in your church denomination. Either you can encourage your church to find a stance or uh, say that you appreciate that your church has found a stance. That is way more important than you probably think. So, um, yeah, you can get a bit creative with those kinds of things. Um, also, uh, I love writing Lenten letters, um, even writing to friends and things like that is a nice excuse. And you can be like, hey, uh, for Lent, I've adopted this practice. Um, do you want to also write to Cuba? Here's a letter I wrote to you and sent in the mail. And here's what I wrote. Like, those can be fun things to, to sort of share and spread around. So you might do something like that for Lent. Um, and the other thing that you might consider is... Uh, if you are not a person in the United States or Canada, it doesn't mean that you couldn't do something like this. Um, most countries have like a Cuba solidarity organization of some kind. Um, there's a big one in the UK. There's a big one in Australia. I mean, they're all over the place. Um, so if you're listening to this, you could always reach out to that organization or even just like peruse their website. And I'm sure you'll find like everybody does some kind of action like it could be as simple as like in the UK, for example, I know there's kind of like a standing committee in Parliament around Cuba. And sometimes the solidarity folks like get in touch with them or have a meeting with them or write to them and so on. So, you know, people in the US obviously have a kind of unique responsibility, I think, to be writing. But uh, the whole world opposes the blockade ostensibly. But the United States just does not apparently fear that or and doesn't care. So the world also needs to find a way to activate its own rhetoric. So just to point out that like nobody's excluded, everybody should be writing to somebody to tell them we got to do something about this. Yeah, that's right. Let me add one very practical note here at the end, writing a letter like in, in mailing something physically, I think is actually pretty important. Right. And I'm not just saying that in the sense of like, it's like a spiritual practice or something to actually write it by hand or type it out on your computer. But, like, I, what I'm saying is that there is, like, a strategic element to sending a physical letter to the White House that I think is overlooked. Like, you could email the president or any of your representatives, and you're going to get, like, a stock email back, and they're not going to have read it for sure, right? <laughs> Maybe some intern has, like, condensed it into some larger report. I don't know. But there is a chance if you actually write a physical letter and send it to the White House that like maybe the president would read it or that the president's staff that um, deals with letter writing and communications might like get get the information to him somehow. Right. That people actually care about this topic. So all that say, um, if you're going to do it, send physical mail. Don't email. I mean, you can email, too. Mm -hmm. I, e Email and send physical mail, but sending physical mail is the important piece. Uh, go get some stamps from the post office and support those great unionized postal workers. <laughs> yeah, and on that note too, um, you uh, you might consider also both um, handwriting a letter and uh, printing it out at a time. Like my brain is permanently broken by using a computer. So I can't think unless I'm typing. So what I have done with some other things before is I'll type something up on my computer and print it and then handwrite, uh, handwrite the same text and just include both because also my handwriting is atrocious. Um, and I think that is helpful, too, because it just shows a level of commitment. Um, Matt and I were on a very funny call like maybe two years ago about uh, Guantanamo Bay, which is also another thing you could write about if you really wanted to, because Biden said that he would shut that down. And guess what? He didn't or hasn't. Um, and uh, someone, I don't know, it was a very weird webinar. But one thing they did say on it was uh, this was like advice from somebody who had like worked in the government that um, handwritten letters, for whatever reason, really actually do make it to people's eyes in ways that other things don't even like printed out stuff. And I think it's just that like, it basically shows that you had the commitment to like use your body <laughs> to like send this to them. I don't know what kind of mystical power handwriting has, but all that to say it is more efficacious. So you might as well take the time to do it. It's Lent after all your hand can cramp. That's just participating in the suffering of Christ. And I think that's important. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. All right, folks, hopefully we've convinced you um, pick up that pen and paper, write to Joseph Biden uh, our second great Catholic president and uh, ask him to take Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism list, get another piece of paper and write to your congressional representatives and tell them to end the blockade. 
Um, and that's what we that's what we need you to do. Um, and here's the really important piece, too. I, I'm sure that most people have already turned the podcast off by now. But when you're sending them, take a picture of you sending the letter and tweet it at us mm-hmm. and we'll retweet you because it's a cool thing to do. Um, it's just great. Great to know that other people are doing it with us. So so do it with us. That's what I'm trying to say. Just get out there and do it. Just get out there and do it. It's 2023. That's our that's the uh, the theme for the year is just get out there and do it. The big Lenten slogan, Lent 2023, just get out there and do it. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like what you're heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Magnificast. If you do, you can get access to our great behind-the-scenes uh, podcast, The Lock-In, which we're now producing once a month, which is great. After a long hiatus, we're back with new weird <laughs> content. Um, you can also get an invite to our Discord channel, which is great too. Um, been having some great conversations there about uh, the Asbury revival, about uh, Just Stop Oil, about, uh, I don't know, recipes, other things too. It's been great. So get on in there. Get on in there too. Just do it for Lent. I mean, you don't have to give us money for Lent, but I'm just saying you should just do it in general. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord Jackson, you keep your hoods up You keep your hoods up And you stay up late Jackson, you keep your hoods up Where you keep your hoods up and you stay up late Oh, don't mind a cold night But we might mind if you leave too soon So come on now, it's still early At least I would have